here. He is an internationally recognized speaker, award-winning scientist, and the world's leading authority on abrupt climate change, leading to near-term human extinction. Professor Emeritus of Conservation Biology at the University of Arizona, Guy lived off-grid for more than a decade. His published works include more than a dozen books and hundreds of scholarly articles. He has been featured on television and radio and in several documentary films. He is a blogger and cultural critic who speaks to general audiences around the globe and to scientists, students, um, educators, and not-for-profit and business leaders who seek their best available options when confronting Earth's calculus with changes. Let's welcome Dr. Thank you, Anne, and, and thanks especially to all of you for coming. I have a handout. I think everybody got one. If you didn't, just raise your hand. And I'm going to hand out a sign-up sheet if you want to receive email messages from me in the future about my work. You can put your email address on there. And if you don't want to, that's fine, too. Because I can't make you learn anything you don't want to learn. <laughs> 21 years in the classroom. I finally figured that one out. I am going to talk about abrupt irreversible climate change. As reported by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. <laughs> Wait, that? that thing is very sensitive. Green you, don't, you don't even touch that thing. Abrupt irreversible electronics. <laughs> yes. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is a political body that produced two reports indicating that climate change is abrupt and irreversible. First, from October 8, 2018, global warming of 1.5 degrees is the name of the report. And they indicate that even abrupt geophysical events do not approach current rates of human-driven change. In other words, the political body known as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change concluded that we are in the midst of the most rapid environmental change in planetary history. I'm going to let that sink in for a minute. This is hugely important. The ability of every organism to respond is dependent completely upon the rate of environmental change. The faster the environment changes, the less chance we have of organisms keeping up with that change. Less than a year later, in the IPCC special report on the ocean and cryosphere in a changing climate, September 24, 2019, the irreversibility of climate change was attributed to an overheating ocean. Remember, it only takes one self-reinforcing feedback loop, or so-called positive feedback, to make climate change irreversible. And the IPCC concluded the irreversibility of climate change with this report. At this point, there have been dozens of peer-reviewed papers indicating further self-reinforcing feedback loops going to the idea of the irreversibility of climate change. Mostly, I want to ask questions. And so I have 10 questions in mind. This is the approach I used in my classrooms for the last 10 years I was on campus at the University of Arizona. And it worked particularly well there because the first day of class, I would point out the website for the class. So students would then have an opportunity to print out all the notes, as you have a copy of the notes here. And then we would have a conversation about the topic of the day. Because I assumed, since everything I know was in that set of notes I gave to the students, that we're on pretty much general terrain at this point. We have points of agreement. So we just have a conversation. I would just ask questions. It's going to be a little more awkward and a little more difficult here because you didn't get the handout in advance. <laughs> so you don't know quite the same material that I have in front of me. That said, I will ask questions and I will, I will ask your response to them and then I will give a reasoned response to that question as we move along. So, is anybody familiar with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change? Raise your hand if, you, if you're familiar with them. And anybody tell me what they are or what they do? Sure. Um, it's a team, primarily a team of scientists from 
around the world um, who are delving into these kinds of questions mm -hmm. and re have put out a series of reports um, including sort of executive summaries for leaders of the world. Right. That's great. They are intended for the leaders of the world, the governments of the world. That's right. One of the things that's interesting about them is that being scientists, they tend to be conservative. Mm -hmm. And the documents they, they publish, that they put, can submit to the public, are always consensual documents. In other words, it's not the opinion of some, some group within the larger body. They are the opinion of the entire body. That's right. That's right. The working groups are comprised of scientists, typically between 15 and 25 scientists, who come together and talk about a particular topic. And they must, they must reach consensus on every point in their report before they can go forward. So if there's a group of 20 scientists and 19 of them think that we are in the midst of irreversible climate change and one of them doesn't, then the, the working group concludes that we are not in the midst of abrupt climate change. So they operate by consensus. Once that consensus is, is reached, it's sent to government bodies. The governments are allowed to redact anything that doesn't look good from the government's perspective. There's, I, I'm gonna give the the description of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, mostly from the IPCC's website. It's an international organization housed within the United Nations. Its predecessor was the Advisory Group on Greenhouse Gases. The IPCC has these working groups that meet very frequently and come to these conclusions and forward information to the world's governments who then contribute further to the reports. A little bit of information that is little known about the IPCC, Princeton professor Michael Oppenheimer on the Environmental Defense Fund blog way back on November 1st, 2007, concluded that during the Reagan administration, which is when the IPCC was formed, the US government quote, saw the creation of the IPCC as a way to prevent the activism stimulated by my colleagues and me from controlling the policy agenda. The IPCC was designed to fail by people within the Reagan administration, which is not too surprising if you're familiar with the Reagan administration's perspective on environmental issues. Despite that, the IPCC reached the conclusion that climate change was abrupt and irreversible topics I'd never read about or hear about in the corporate media anymore. It was the ultimate two-second blurb in the news. So what is this thing called anthropogenic climate change? Anybody? Yeah? Climate change driven by human behavior. Right. As opposed to natural events. Historically, there have been many warming and cooling events in planetary history, mostly driven by something called the Milankovitch cycle, which is a slight wobble of the Earth's rotation that causes differential heating and drives important changes. Anthropogenic climate change refers to, oh, that thing doesn't like me at all. I'm just going to stand over here. <laughs> I had students like that. <laughs> you just couldn't get close to them. <laughs> Since the mid 1700s. Is there a pointer? You need a pointer. No, yeah, it's the projector. It's no, do you have like a little stick, a yardstick you could use as a pointer? It's okay. I'll just stay away. <laughs> I know better now. So as I already indicated, shifts have occurred naturally throughout planetary history and have been well documented with proxy records because most of them occurred before humans showed up, of course, and certainly before humans started keeping records. But since the mid-1700s, climate change has been driven by unnatural 
events, most notably our propensity for producing, producing greenhouse gases. I refer to, uh, the easiest way to understand this is you leave your car parked in a parking lot and the sun is shining and you come out from the store you were in, the grocery store, whatever, you come out, you get into your car and it's warm in there, right? And you didn't leave the heater on, the car wasn't running that whole time. So I refer to automobiles as greenhouses on wheels because they so clearly show the greenhouse effect. This light comes in, energy comes in, and some of the long wave radiation is trapped. It can't escape, so it stays in that greenhouse that you call a car. And there are many other greenhouse gases besides carbon dioxide. That's probably the best known one, but there are 42 additional greenhouse gases, the most common of which is water vapor. And there's a very fast feedback with respect to water vapor. The planet heats, it evaporates water, goes up into the atmosphere, serves as a lens, just like some of us when we were uninformed, unenlightened children, got magnifying glasses and shined them on ants to cause their deaths. And that's what the water vapor is doing in the atmosphere. And it's a very fast feedback loop because it takes a little energy to, to increase the heat of that water increasing the water vapor in the atmosphere, which immediately begins further warming the planet. Others include methane that's, that's fairly well known and many others. So a really important concept with respect to how we respond as a species, as a society, as a population, as a community, is habitat. What is habitat? We are you know, one of the most horrible things you can call somebody is an animal, right? You call somebody an animal, that's a terrible thing. We are all human animals. Specifically, we're homo sapiens, which means the wise ape. And in fact, we're a subspecies of homo sapiens called sapiens, so we're the doubly wise ape. Sometimes I'm not so sure about that. but. But as with every other organism on the planet, every other animal, we require habitat to survive. Anybody know what habitat is? What is that? Maybe hunters, anglers, people who spend a lot of time outside trying to trap an organism so they can eat them. Every time I move something in my yard, I'm destroying habitat. Uh -huh. Goots, ants, bugs, mm -hmm. worms. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Um, what I moved was providing them with what they needed to survive. Okay. Including what? What do they need to survive? Uh, storing their food, their babies. Water. Somebody said water. water. Yep. Water. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So, and, and think about what we need as human animals. Same thing. To survive, we need water. We need food. We need air to breathe. We need some means of maintaining our body temperature clothing, structures, whatever, we, so, we, so we create all these things that are designed basically to keep us comfortable with the clothes we wear and the, the buildings we occupy. From the peer-reviewed literature, from a student I worked with at the University of Arizona, <sighs> she wasn't like that at all. <laughs> and two faculty members, two professors I worked with there. Habitat includes the resources and conditions present in an area that produce occupancy, including survival and reproduction. So it's not just about the current generation, it's about the ability of future generations to survive as well by a given organism. And of course that's organism specific because you, you turn up that dirt in your yard and some of those organisms clearly are gonna die. So that's why they're running away. They're trying to escape. And others just go in a little deeper. Maybe they dig a half an inch deeper and they're fine. It's organism specific. So basically it's the sum of the materials needed by that particular organism to survive and reproduce. Yes, sorry. From the border area, you know, they, they built this border and animals can't migrate anymore. That's right. There's no migration, there's all the routes, are, even the salmon can't go up the rivers anymore. All right. the uh, migration routes are getting close, jammed, detours. 
Right. I That's understand. human migration too, the environment where these people live, and we consider them outsiders and all this, but their habitat, there's a reason why they're coming up here. Of their, course. Their habitat's been exploited for centuries now. Yes, if you spend any time in the if you spend any time in the southwestern United States, you're well aware of the issue, the controversy surrounding building a wall to keep people out. Well, it also disrupts the movement of other organisms, not just humans. And it's a, politically, it's an unmitigated disaster. Build a 12-foot wall and somebody will come up with a 13-foot ladder. My, my parents used to do volunteer work at Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument, which is ex in extreme southwestern Arizona. And they, the federal government was building this wall, they put up the iron wall, and within a day, there was a door cut out of it with a welder. And the only doorknob was on the Mexican side of the border. <laughs> so you can only get, enter from one way. <laughs> so. <laughs> right, but animals can't do that. <laughs> Europe, some man called Europe a garden in the rest of the world, the jungle, and now they're getting invaded by the jungle now. Right, absolutely. The feedback. So, the next question might seem a little strange. What is required to sustain civilizations? We have a civilization known as industrial civilization, but there have been many other civilizations that came before this one, and they've come, they've disappeared, but they have only existed within the last few thousand years. We have no evidence of civilizations before about 10,000 years ago when the Holocene started. So why is that? What do we need to sustain those civilizations? Daniel? You have to be able to grow food at scale. Yes, you definitely have to be able to grow food, and most notably, you have to be able to grow grains at scale at a large scale, because the grains are the things that are easy to store. So if you look in the southwestern United States, where the Anasazi and many other pre-colonization by white people occurred, you look at the evidence, you look at the caves, you look at the structures that were built, what's in there? Grains, most notably maize or corn. Wheat is another big one. Rice is another big grain, depending upon the part of the world. Well, up until about 10,000 years ago, we have no evidence of civilizations, of, of the ability to build cities, to overpopulate a local area by relying upon the surrounding area for resources. And that's because we have to be able to grow, store, and distribute grains at scale to maintain a civilization, at a large scale to maintain a civilization. And before the Holocene, there's no evidence of any civilizations. And so there must be something going on in the Holocene because we had human beings for a few million years before that, and yet there was no sign that those human beings organized into things resembling cities that extracted materials from outside the cities and allowed for meeting places within. And so what's going on there? And so that gets at the question, what is required to grow, store, and distribute abundant grains? And it appears that, that what is required is a stable, cool habitat. We're gonna have to have a talk after class. Over the last many millions of years, during the time there have been humans present on the planet, no civilizations developed. But then, coming out of the last ice age into the Holocene, we had a cool, stable planetary temperature. Planetary temperature was about 13 and a half degrees Celsius. And suddenly, civilizations were popping up all over the place. It was like trolls on YouTube. They're everywhere. That never happened before. So, almost certainly, it was because the cool, stable temperature allowed the ability to grow grains 
store the grains and distribute the grains at a relatively large scale. That's where the evidence points in any event. Okay. Seemingly changing the subject, is anybody familiar with the El Nino Southern Oscillation? Yes. You seem to know a lot of things. You keep raising your hand. I'm just stretching, you know. I don't <laughs> <laughs> it's, you, it's you front of the room people. That's what's going on. <laughs> I, what I know about El Nino is that it is a um, periodic disturbance hmm? that, um, at least in its present uh, form, cause it causes uh, enormous heat mm -hmm. um, that produces heat waves, especially in uh, the southern hemisphere, mm -hmm. but very definitely in our own, as we're seeing in the northwest, for example, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the southwest, and we may even in the bubble of Vermont come to experience right. these heat waves. Right. Anybody want to add? Subtract? Disagree? Yeah. As a gardener, uh -huh. I'm really aware the changes. Um, we, it looked like we were going to have our last frost on April 10th, which is about a month early, and then we got whammed later than our old normal frost-free day. Just, was that just last week? That was last week. Right. 25 degrees in my garden here in Dallas Falls. Mm -hmm. We have lost and, much of the apple crop. And apple lost the apple Catastrophic uh, damage. Right. We lost the apple crop, which is this is apple growing country, so really obvious right here. Right. And so we now identify, during about the last 75 years, scientists have identified three stages of El Nino. There's the El Nino Southern Oscillation, there's the La Nina, and there's the neutral phase. And what we've had very uncharacteristically for the first time in at least 75 years, we're in the midst of a triple dip La Nina which is the cooling cycle. The El Nino Southern Oscillation, oscillation is characterized by warmer than usual sea surface temperatures. So you can think of the ocean as a battery that stores heat and greenhouse gases. And that heat and greenhouse gases are being put into the ocean during the La Nina. That's why it's cooling the lands where we live. But then the El Nino Southern Oscillation comes along. It's named El Nino, which means little boy in Spanish. And that's because it was first noticed by fishermen in places where they spoke Spanish, mostly South America, at around Christmas time. So at Christmas time, people noticed this sudden warming of the sea surface temperatures, which influenced the fish catch. So imagine that the ocean stores greenhouse gases and heat. During the El Nino Southern Oscillation, the ocean warms and releases a bunch of that heat and the greenhouse gases as well. NOAA announced on the 11th of May, just earlier this month, that after three consecutive years of La Nina, a cooling event for the first time that we've been keeping track, for the 75 years or so that we've been keeping track of La Nina and El Nino, we've had this triple dip La Nina, which has made the planet particularly cool. And it appears that we're headed into a pretty significant El Nino Southern Oscillation at this point, which is likely to release abundant greenhouse gases and heat from the ocean. And that will be potentially catastrophic because in 2017, according to a peer-reviewed paper by James Hansen and, and colleagues, the temperature was the warmest it had been with any civilization present on Earth. So it's a particularly warm temperature already. That was in 2017. It's warmed up considerably since 2017. If we get a sudden and abrupt warming event from El Nino, that'll make things really interesting. Yeah. Since the ocean has been absorbing uh, carbon mm -hmm. for all along, and it's really saved us in a sense, mm -hmm. but it's now reached a point where it's near capacity. Right. I wonder if you could explain the relationship of El Nino to the fact that the ocean is going to have to, is going to give up this uh, 
this carbon, which will which will exacerbate heating anyway. Yes. Is there a relationship between yes. that fact and, and the El Nino that you're talking about? Absolutely. You're just two slides ahead of me. Oh, I'm sorry. And so this gets at the point of the rate of environmental change and the importance of the rate of environmental change. As the environment changes, individuals, populations, and species have difficulty keeping up. If the environment changes very slowly, we can adapt. If it changes very, very slowly, entire species can adapt. If it changes very quickly, and we're already, remember, at the highest temperature observed on Earth with civilizations present. So if it heats up further, that might be problematic. So as pointed out in this peer-reviewed paper in the journal Oikos, a rapid rate of environmental change restricts the ability of organisms, populations, or communities to respond. And that makes perfect sense. You know, imagine you're in your house and the electricity goes out and it stays out. And so now you're in a situation that the house isn't providing the kind of heating it was previously and we're going into winter. How are you going to adapt? Probably not. As human animals, unless we're going to come up with some way of heating the house, building a fire, preferably not in the middle of the living room, so unless you have other means of staying warm, you're going to be in real trouble. Sorry, I got a slide ahead of myself there. So the rapid rate of environmental change restricts the ability of organisms, populations, or communities to respond, as pointed out in this peer-reviewed paper in Oikos. Already, the rate of environmental change projected by the scientifically conservative Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change outstrips the ability of, verte of vertebrates to adapt by a factor of 10,000 times. 10,000 times faster than vertebrates can keep up. And mammals can't keep up either, according to the prestigious proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And the go-to taxon for people who think that climate change can't affect everything is tardigrades. Even tardigrades can't keep up with the ongoing rate of change. Vertebrates can't keep up, mammals can't keep up, we're vertebrate mammals. We fall into two categories of can't keep up. That's a problem. What are tardigrades? Tardigrades are, um, what are they sometimes called? They're small ocean. Water bears. Water, bears. water bears, sometimes called water bears in the ocean. There's little tiny things that seem to have a, an incredibly wide latitude in terms of environments that they can inhabit and changes in that environment that they can inhabit. So they're the go-to taxon for people who say something has got to survive no matter what we do because they're found across a wide array of environments. Yeah. People seem to be broadly convinced that their big brains will get us out of any rate of change, no matter how quickly the rate. Sure. Um, can you elaborate on why? We're we're really really smart. We really are. I mean, we have these big brain brains that that allowed us to conquer the world. There's been no other species in the history of this planet that has been able to completely change the planet at every level. From the air to the water. I grew up in northern Idaho a long time ago. And everywhere we went, my, my parents were big anglers and hunters. So we spent a lot of time outdoors. Every place we went, we just needed to carry something that would hold water. Because we could drink out of the stream. I never imagined a world where I couldn't drink out of the stream. This was only 50 years ago. There's no place, uh, there's maybe two places in the continental United States that I would drink the water now. It was everywhere when I was a kid. Now it's essentially nowhere. We have destroyed the planet. And it's not just us. It's not just us who needs the water. It's every other species on the planet that needs potable water as well. Now, some species are better adapted than we are at dealing with that water. I think I'll get a little more 
on point with your question later, but if I don't, please bring me back to it. With respect to the rate of environmental change, we're already in the fastest rate of environmental change according to the political conservative body known as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. We're already in the fastest rate of change in planetary history. If we want to speed that up, an ice-free Arctic Ocean will do the trick. The Arctic Ocean is the planetary air conditioner, and that's how it's referred to by scientists. The Arctic is the planetary air conditioner, not the Antarctic, interestingly enough. It's the Arctic that cools the globe. We're losing ice floating on the Arctic Ocean faster than at any time in planetary history, as nearly as we can tell. Two. Why is, it more, why is the Arctic more significant in terms of that than Antarctica? Than Antarctica? Well, for one thing, about 90% of the people live in the Northern Hemisphere. And perhaps as importantly, maybe even more importantly, the jet stream is controlled, the jet stream for the Northern Hemisphere is controlled by a cold Arctic. So you've heard of the Polar Express, there's all these names that have come out within the last decade or so to describe new phenomena with respect to the weather or the climate. And that's because the, the ice is melting in the Arctic very rapidly. Two renowned professors, Professor James Anderson at Harvard and Jennifer McKinnon at the University of California, San Diego, predicted that we would already have an ice-free Arctic Ocean or that it would occur this year. Fortunately, that seems extremely unlikely. The U.S. Naval Postgraduate School has put together a research team that this is what they do. They develop a six-month forecast, a six-month ensemble forecast, they call it. And the ensemble forecast, I, I check it every 10 minutes, I swear, around the 1st of April, because it, it goes out six months in advance. And starting first, first of April is when, you, when we get to the point that the end of September, which is when there's the least ice in the Arctic. So around the first of April, we, we start to figure out what's gonna happen the end of September and whether we're gonna have ice there or not. And the six month ensemble forecast, which is very scientifically conservative, indicates that we will not have an ice free Arctic Ocean. In fact, there will end up at the low point on September 17th, according to the forecast I checked this morning. On September 17th will be the low point and there will be about 4.665 million square kilometers of ice floating on the Arctic Ocean. So that's a lot. Anything less than a million square kilometers of ice floating on the Arctic Ocean is classified as an ice-free Arctic Ocean. It appears we're not going to come close to that this year. This is cause for celebration. When I discovered that, I took Pauline out to dinner. <laughs> this, we produced a video on the Nature Bats last YouTube channel immediately because this is the most important and most surprising thing to happen in quite a long time. Interestingly, that six-month ensemble forecast produced by the U.S. Nav U.S. Naval Postgraduate School is conservative. Stop it. And we're going to have to have a talk. Some students just don't behave. I think you snuck in from the side that time. <laughs> so I have to be sneaky. That's what you're saying. Come out from the back. <laughs> The research team, the team of professors that put together the, the ensemble forecast that has been used only for the last two years, that's the same research team headed by Vislav Maslowski that published a paper called The Future of Arctic Sea Ice in one of the most scientifically conservative publications on the planet, the Annual Review series. Specifically, it was in the Annual Review of Earth and Planetary Sciences in 2012 and they projected based on the existing data that we would have an ice-free arctic ocean in 2016 plus or minus three years that takes us through 2019 we're four years after that and we're not going to have an ice-free arctic ocean I, I can pretty much guarantee it this year so 
that's, that's amazing and it's an indication of how conservative they are because they were wrong the first time around with that paper in the annual review of Earth and Planetary Sciences. So they're taking a very conservative approach this time around. Uh, from a scientific standpoint, what do you think their models were missing? Well, they relied upon a linear projection. So they had relatively few, they had relatively few data points. They only had data up to 2009 and satellite data for the Arctic Ocean started in the late 1970s, I think 1979. So they went up to 2009, that's not very long, 30 years. And so they had this 30 data points and the last of them was 2009, which was by far the least amount of ice floating in the Arctic Ocean to that point so far. So whereas without that 2009 point, maybe the linear projection they were using would look like this, but with 2009, it dragged it down. So it hit 2016 plus or minus three years. So that was important. They relied upon a linear projection. And as it turns out, that was, that was the wrong way to go. They were clear with that's what, you know, this is what we're doing. We're using this linear projection. And so they, they cut all kinds of flack for that, as you might imagine, because this appeared in a renowned peer reviewed journal. And they were wrong. They were wrong by a lot. 2016, plus or minus three years. I remember the first corporate media news story I saw about this. I think it was in US News and World Report. Maybe it was USA Today. And the headline says, Ice Free Arctic Ocean in 2016, 84 years ahead of schedule. Like everything happens in 2100, we all knew that, right? <laughs> Nobody told the Arctic, but we all know that everything happens in 2100. That's the IPCC's approach. Everything's gonna happen in 20, we're, we're gonna have the, this planet just like we have right now. And then we're gonna be sailing along, we hit 2100, bam, like we're gonna hit a wall. That's insane. So there's no 84 years ahead of schedule. So yeah. you exclude that outlying data point, what would the projection be? Oh, that's a good question, I have no idea. I should go back and look. It's an open access journal, so anybody can track down the annual review for Earth and Planetary Sciences, find the January 2012 edition, find the paper called The Future of Arctic Sea Ice by Mieslaw Wieslowski, he's, he's Polish, and three other authors. And you can see, if you take out that point, where it would have ended up. Yeah, Daniel. I, I want to go back to Enzo for a second. There's, there's a lot of variability and a lot of unpredictability around that, isn't there? Like oh, yes. How, how much is it going to be released and when and how long it'll last? All those things. And going into this, the six month ensemble forecast, I wonder sometimes if they're not too conservative. After that screw up the last time, maybe they went too far the other way. Yeah. And I, and I have to admit, I didn't read the report and I don't know what's in the models. Do they figure the ENSO? No, no they don't. Because the ENSO, the El Nino Southern Oscillation, is notoriously unpredictable. I don't think any scientist would have predicted a triple dip La Nina. It's the first time in, in the 75 years we've been keeping track. So that's a, that's a bug that might overcome the system. So it could be that the El Nino comes along probably this fall, if it persists as expected through next year, then that might be enough to cause an ice-free Arctic Ocean next year, if not this year. And that's a, that's a really big deal. And again, I'm stunned we made it this long without an ice-free Arctic Ocean. Yeah? I'm curious as to whether or not a factor in any of this, uh, particularly that three-year cycle, has anything to do with the three Yes, I'm going to get to that point where well, you're bringing up something called aerosol masking, which is the best kept secret in climate science. I'm going to get to that shortly, so if you just bear with me. 
When did the Industrial Revolution begin? People know this one. 1750. Yeah, 1750, plus or minus a few years, somewhere in the mid 1700s. Mid 1700s in Great Britain, when we we came up with machines that would make things go faster than the way we were, do, we were doing them by hand. So that's the bottom line. Then we get to your question. Is anybody familiar with the aerosol masking effect? Has anybody ever heard aerosol masking until I just mentioned it? One, two, three, four, half a dozen, yes. Everybody knows the aerosol masking effect. What's the matter with the rest of you people? <laughs> That's amazing because usually when I speak, I didn't understand, I, I did not discover the aerosol masking effect until 2012, which is three plus years after I left active service at the University of Arizona. Had I known about the aerosol masking effect, I would still be on campus drawing the six figure salary for doing the work I love to do. But no. So I'm surprised people know about aerosol masking. The aerosol masking effect results from industrial activity, as do those greenhouse gases. But in this case, there are tiny particles, aerosols, that are put up into the atmosphere. And they act as something like mirrors or umbrellas, preventing sunlight from getting through the atmosphere. So imagine putting a shield in the upper atmosphere, specifically the stratosphere, and that prevents light from coming through. If the light can't come through, then it can't warm the planet and produce those greenhouse gases. The aerosol masking effect involves these tiny particles, according to James Hansen, the, the godfather of climate science. The aerosols fall out of the atmosphere in about five days. He said this in numerous interviews and presentations. The cooling resulting from the current aerosol masking, at least the latest peer-reviewed paper I've seen on the topic, which is in the open access journal, Nature Communications, so you can track it down yourself. It's by Ja et al. And it indicates 55% masking globally and 133% on land. Most of us live on land. So we're currently more than two degrees C above the 1750 baseline. Let's say we're at two, 133% increase over land means 1.2 about additional. So within a few days after aerosol masking is reduced, after industrial activity is reduced, we will experience this very rapid heating. And that was observed in the pandemic, during the pandemic, regionally, never globally. There are numerous peer-reviewed papers indicating there was incredibly high heating starting in the area around Wuhan, China, moving to Africa, to Western Europe, and to the Northeastern United States, but only for relatively short periods of time, increased heating and also increased precipitation. As the atmosphere warms, it's capable of more, holding more moisture, so there's more rain. As climate scientists have been saying since the 1970s, a warmer Earth is a wetter Earth. And so that's been observed many places regionally. We've been lucky because there hasn't been a planetary loss of aerosol masking, and therefore warming and increased moisture. Yeah? Well, that also occurred after 9-11. Yes. But it, it also presents an interesting dynamic. Many of us see this as a race between nuclear winter and the methane firestorms and the aerosol masking effect wherever civilization goes down and will it really matter? You know what I mean? Yeah, oh yeah. And, and once the nuclear power plants go off, we have nuclear winter. And it probably would benefit life in the hereafter for us to have a nuclear winter first so the methane firestorms don't occur and life will proceed and evolve with just a mess of nuclear you know nonsense rather than being you know firestormed out yeah yeah you know i i love it when i'm the most optimistic person in the room 
<laughs> it's awesome. No, you're dead on. It's almost as if we're screwed either way. It's like a volcano. Every time there's a volcano, it's it, 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 there. Yes, yes, that's right. So, as I already indicated, by accounting for sampling biases, oh, in previous work, the magnitude of aerosol masking increased by 55% globally, 133% over land. This is huge. And again, this is in the open access nature communications. So you can actually look this up yourself. So their word or their phrase for aerosol masking. It's a, it's a concept that is relatively little discussed. So people are still struggling to come up with a common language to describe it. The aerosol masking effect. BBC did a, did a relatively short report, about 55 minutes, um, and called it global dimming. And this was, do you remember when that was? 2009. I think it was 2005, now that you mention it. Okay. Anyway, er, sometime in the early 2000s, um, BBC produced this report on global dimming, and I think that was the name of it, it was global dimming, I'm not sure. And, and because basically these aerosols go up and they dim the planet. They're like a bunch of umbrellas up there, keeping us cool. So interestingly, if we reduce industrial activity, we get rid of some of those aerosols and we warm the planet. And if we don't decrease industrial activity, we continue to super, superheat the planet. So what we have here, yeah, you know, I didn't want to use that language, but you're a bunch of doomers, so you can say whatever you want. As a consequence, <laughs> I believe that anthropogenic climate change proposes, poses an, an existential threat to our species, and as a result, to all species on Earth. I'll get to that in a minute. The response from climate scientists, media outlets, and government officials is no problem. We got this. Right? I mean, this, what do you hear in association with every one of the COPs, the Conference of Parties, number 28 is coming up this fall? What do you hear every time? You hear that you and I, we the people, have to reduce our consumption. We have to not drive so much and not fly so much. There's a friend I haven't met yet who's a personal assistant for a billionaire. She lives in Zurich, Switzerland. And she tells me that when the billionaire takes his personal jet somewhere, which he does so he doesn't have to drive a car 20 miles or whatever, whenever he takes his personal jet, he takes two personal jets, the one he flies in and the one that's 100 miles in front to detect the air pockets because we can't expect a billionaire to hit a fucking air pocket, can we? That would be just a little inconvenient. <laughs> so, you can think of it this way. We got billionaires who are maintaining aerosol masking <laughs> and doing us all a favor, and we got the rest of us who damn well better conserve or we're in real trouble. <sighs> you know, I try not to be judgmental. All the, all the evidence from neurobiology indicates that we have very limited amount of free will. So all those billionaires are just doing what they're, they're programmed to do, right? So I try not to take it all so personally. A little bit more on the numbers. As little as a 35% reduction in aerosol masking, which probably equates to a 35% reduction in industrial activity, causes a very rapid rise in global average temperature. And since that paper came out in the peer-reviewed Journal of Geophysical Research Atmospheres in May of 2013, that's 10 years ago, other research indicates that that was entirely too conservative uh, a, a presentation. And so I've already indicated these data here. As an example, somebody mentioned volcanoes and the amount of 
aerosol masking or dimming they provide with every volcano. The Toba, and, and this paper came out, obviously, this is April 12th, 2021, so it's relatively recently. The one supervolcano from long ago caused severe stratospheric ozone depletion. That's from ionizing radiation from that volcano. The nuclear power plants meltdown, if even a relatively small fraction of the 450 plus nuclear power plants around the world melt down, then that ionizing radiation is gonna strip away stratospheric ozone. And you think things are, are, are warming up quickly now. Has anybody seen the 2021 film Finch? I would, I would strongly recommend it. Finch? Finch, like the bird. It's named after the character played by Tom Hanks. His last name is Finch. And it's great. It shows very subtly the loss of aerosol masking when the nuclear power plants melt down. It doesn't ever say that's what's going on. But people stick their hand out in the sunlight and it starts to fry. They get a sunburn in a matter of seconds. Now that's, that's Hollywood overload, okay? It actually would take minutes, not seconds. But still, it's kind of a big deal. And apparently the writers of Finch knew about it, but almost nobody else does. And I never hear a paid climate scientist talk about global dimming or the aerosol mask effect ever. So enough water can block radiation. Water can actually block it pretty effectively. So would deep sea creatures survive such an event? Maybe, you know, let me see if I have a slide that addresses that issue. Yes, they have, oh, there we go. This is a famous paper by Giovanni. <laughs> You'd think I'd learn, right? I'm a sentient animal. But no. Giovanna Strona and Corey Bradshaw wrote this paper published in the Scientific Reports, which is part of the renowned Nature series. It's open access, and they, they indicate that the that the odds of surviving a five to six degree Celsius global average temperature rise from the 17, starting with the mid 1700s. So we're already at two. If we have an, an additional three or four degrees global average temperature rise over the next several hundred years, they say we'll lose all life on earth. And then they say, a rogue, seemingly desert Earth wandering across the universe could still have some tiny chance of blooming again under some lucky and unlikely circumstances. This from the renowned Nature series of publications. So maybe, maybe bacteria would make it, but probably not. The rate of environmental change is the all-important factor here. It's already warming faster than at any time in planetary history. But, this warming of an additional three or four degrees Celsius beyond what we are right now has the potential to destroy all life on Earth. That's just based on the rate of change. That doesn't account for the nuclear power plants melting down, stripping away stratospheric ozone with the ionizing radiation and causing superheating in the planet. So there's two means by which we could destroy all life on Earth. And it seems we are rapidly pursuing them as if there's some sort of prize at the end. I'm such a bummer. He's been doing this for years. Yeah, you'd think I'd learn. Well, I grow used to it. <laughs> I'm used to it. Okay, so I think I'll just stop right there. Yeah. One point I'd like to make is that when we talk about the uh, miscalculations of scientists, mm -hmm. the scientists, much like the human race in general, see progress in a linear fashion. Mm -hmm. Exponential growth is not something, to, and I think that's why we're seeing so many reports over the, over the last few years of scientists say, oh my God, I was so off. Look, right. this is going to happen, that's going to happen. Because right. they did not take into consideration that Mother Nature, who, as you 
a quote from that uh, wonderful person who talked about nature batting last, mm -hmm. um, doesn't go by linear growth, it goes right. by exponential growth. Right. And, you know, interestingly, we're only familiar with linear growth. That's, that's how we evolved as human animals, is we predict the near future based on events that have happened in the recent past. We're only familiar with what, is, what has happened during our lives. Last decade or two, we should be able to use that to predict what's gonna happen over the course of the next decade or two. That's the way we've all, always operated and that's the way always, all organisms operate. But now we're in the midst of exponential change and we're very poorly suited to deal with exponential change along with every other organism on the planet. We're in the midst of the most rapid environmental change in planetary history. Keeping up seems like a pipe dream. As clever as we are, Homo sapiens sapiens, the doubly wise ape, and yet, we can't keep up with the current rate of environmental change. Yeah. Um, when did man get so fragmented? States, nations, counties, everything's separate. Now we're almost at a point of civil war in this country. We're armed to the teeth. Our children can't even go to school because they get killed. Uh, school shootings, mass shootings everywhere. Uh, war with Russia, China. When did we get so fragmented to be separated from the environment? Is uh, it an issue of consciousness somehow? We can't see holiness anymore. We're so fragmented. We're, we can't crystallize ourselves. We're uh, so mentally such a psychosis now. I see this problem more of our separateness from everything. We're such, such a love fragmented society. We can't even make peace with our own kind, let alone the creatures to make our lives possible. The smallest ones to pollinate our crops. When did we lose this wholeness? Did we surrender our wholeness? To be born in, in a world that I see that is so synchristic uh, in its nature. The, the moon, the sun, the earth, the way it spins. How did we lose this? As nearly, How did we lose it? As nearly as I can tell, that happened during the Cognitive Revolution. The Cognitive Revolution occurred mm, a little over 70,000 years ago. And during the Cognitive Revolution, for reasons that are unclear, humans decided they were different from and therefore superior to mm -hmm. all other organisms. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows why that happened, but suddenly the wise ape decided they were the wise ape. Suddenly we, collectively, not you and me, as a species, we decided we're different from everything else. And that's when the exploit exploitation began. So if your virtual absence of free will is not enough to convince you that this isn't your fault, and it's not her fault, and it's not your fault, then how about the Cognitive Revolution, which is more than 70,000 years ago, when we decided as a species that we're superior to every other species on the planet, and therefore exploita exploitation is just what we do. Well, are you saying for all cultures in the world? Yes. For some reason, well, let me take that back. Indigenous cultures have never bought into the idea of civilizations. Many indigenous cultures, in fact, the few remaining still today, live differently than the rest of us. Civilizations arose from the ideas that developed in the Cognitive Revolution, but some people didn't go along with the idea. What did we do to those people? We killed them. Mm. You take science now? I feel science in what you call this magnetic wisdom might be able to merge, you know. You know, science, actually, it's very obvious that it says we're all connected. Everything yes. is connected, science is saying. And, and the mystics are saying the same thing. <coughs> so yes. I think consciousness has to become whole again. Yes. The problem is 
is consciousness, I think. We're separated, fragmented beings now. Edward O. Wilson, E. O. Wilson, who died December 26th last year, he was a professor at Harvard. He wrote a book in the late 1990s called Consilience, The Unity of Knowledge. And I would strongly recommend reading that book because it gets at the point that you're driving at. Wilson points out that we have it within our means as big-brained homo sapiens to merge spiritualism with hardcore science. Wilson was roundly denigrated for this approach. People like Wendell Berry, who leans on the, cons on the spiritual side, said that's crazy. Scientists can't do that. And the science community said, that's crazy. We're not spiritual people. I strongly recommend that book. I think it came out in 1998. And it's, it's Consilience, C-O-N-S-I-L-I-E-N-C-E. Consilience, the subtitle is The Unity of Knowledge. And as far as I know, it represents the first attempt to unify all knowledge since Sir Francis Bacon's Novum Organum in 1604, 1605. And, and it's wonderful, and it does it in less than 300 pages. Yeah? I can't remember the name of the people who uh, coined this term, but it's M-O-R-T, Mind Over Reality Theory. And it's sort of... Um, a part of the whole cognitive renaissance thing, you know, uh, presupposing that as human uh, intellectual facilities developed, there reached a point where they became aware of death. And that uh, led into this sort of like root dissociation where they had to be like, no, I can't think about death, otherwise all I'll think about is my own mortality. Mm -hmm. And that separation of sorts was evidently very evolutionarily successful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you could probably argue that that led to a lot of the separateness that we see in modern culture. As Edward Abbey, the Southwestern American writer, wrote, the fear, something like this, the fear of death stems directly from the fear of life. A man who lives fully is prepared to die at any time. I was a little misogynistic, but I think it applies to women as well. And, but, but his point is that if we live fully, then it doesn't take 65 or 70 or 80 years to have a full life. It takes months or minutes. The present moment. Absolutely. The present moment is all we have. Homer wrote in the Iliad, any moment might be our last. And in the paragraph before, he wrote that this is why the gods envy us. The gods are cursed to live forever. Any moment may be our last. As a result, we get to live, we have to live with urgency. Now is all we have. E.O. Wilson was a brilliant man. He was a hero of mine. And he also wrote The Origins of Creativity, which was his second attempt at conciliance. You have to understand that Eel was a believer. He believed in Christianity early on before he became a scientist or yeah, a he was the son of a Baptist. He was the son of a Baptist preacher. But as a confirmed empirical rationalist, he believed in humanity. He mm -hmm. actually thought that he could fuse the sciences and religion, i.e. rational thought and non-rational thought. Now you have to go back to the Pleistocene and coming out of the Pleistocene to understand this, what I call, homo fictionalis. During the Pleistocene, we operated in small extended, fa extended mm -hmm. families under kin selection. It was all about cooperation. Mm -hmm. We didn't compete with one another. Mm -hmm. When the end of the Pleistocene came down, during the Neolithic, we got into larger groups, we went tribal, we had to use group selection. 
And group selection made culture because it not only depended on how we modified our biology with our hairstyles and stuff, it depended on beliefs. And belief is fiction made real. Your creation myth, your, you know, all this folklore stuff, it's all made up in your mind. And that's what's very important. So people have been fighting about their culture and about their beliefs forever and ever. And that's why we can't fuse science and religion. It's all made up. Right. And not forever, only within the last couple million years. <laughs> That's not forever. Forever is a long time, especially toward the end, but it's longer than two million years. Yeah. Yes, you're absolutely right. And so at this point, I think any rational scientist would have to conclude that because the stunningly scientifically conservative intergovernmental panel on climate change has concluded we're in the midst of abrupt irreversible climate change. I think any rational scientist, any rational person would have to conclude that we're done, right? All we have is this moment that, that we don't have long to live. How long do we have? Probably until that first ice-free Arctic Ocean, and I'm stunned that it hasn't happened yet. But that's been the trickiest phenomenon for any scientist to accurately predict. When does it happen? Apparently not this year. Does it happen next year? The year after that? Will it be five years? Do we have another 10 years? I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. But at least for me, living with urgency is a way that I can maximize the moments I have in my life. And so that's what I encourage for other people to do. Yeah, Tom? Do you think the actions of the wise ape will cause Earth to become a clone of Venus? Oh, yeah. Oh, I said that very quickly, didn't I? It's as if I didn't think about it at all. Because if that happens, not even the sea creatures will survive. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, already, and, and as, uh, who's the founder of Sea Shepherd? Come on, everybody knows, right? White hair, bearded guy. That's everyone. That's <laughs> everybody in Vermont. Sure. Just all the men. Paul Watson. Paul Watson is a, is a renowned uh, study of the oceans. He's been spent his life in the oceans. He said, without a, without a living ocean, none of us survive. And that makes perfect sense because that's where we came from. That's where land animals came from, is from the ocean. That's where life started on this planet is in the ocean. So of course without an ocean we don't survive. And it appears that we are intent upon destroying all life in the ocean. So we can have another fish sandwich. Or whatever. And, and at the same time I don't want to be judgmental about people who eat fish sandwiches. You know, I've been known to do that myself. But there's more than eight billion of us here on the planet now. And that puts us into this awkward predicament of we have to have fewer people, but nobody's letting me decide which ones get to go. That's the real problem. I have a list. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you have a list too. People who really don't deserve to live any longer. <laughs> but here we are, we're stuck with more than 8 billion people on the planet wanting everything. Needing everything. Yes, absolutely, of course it's right now. You just want to get out of here so you can go get a pizza, right? We all want, we all need more. Yeah? How many fish sandwiches do you think we have left? <laughs> <laughs> you know what's really interesting? The UK government decided, this is probably about 10 years ago, that because of the positive effects of fish oil, that every child in the public school system was going to get a fish oil tablet every day. Because it's amazing what fish oil does for you. You know, it's incredible stuff. And then they did the math. There's not enough fish in the ocean 10 years ago for every child in Britain to have a fish oil tablet every day. We ran out of fish for that. 
I don't know how long we have. I'm stunned we made it this long. I predicted human extinction either 2017 or 2018. You'd think I know because I get reminded of it every day <laughs> by some troll on YouTube. Because of that paper in the Annual Review of Earth and Planetary Sciences, the future of Arctic sea ice that projected an ice free Arctic in 2016 plus or minus three years. So I thought we were toast then. That's five years ago. I've had five years beyond what I thought what I would live in. My back has hurt really bad for that five years, but I'm glad I've had it anyway. Every moment is something to treasure. I don't know how long we have. I don't think we have long. But, you know, if you really focus on living, fully living every moment, then a year can be a long time, and I think we probably have a year. So then you could say, well, of course we've never had long. I mean, death is always there. <laughs> death is always over the shoulder, right? But we have now. I've been listening to your podcast for a while, and the last one I heard was you, you come to uh, Bellows Falls to make your peace, you know? Mm -hmm. Kind of like the ending. You, know? you know, it's pretty interesting. Uh, I moved with partner Pauline to Belize in 2015. 15? No, 16. 2016. July of 2016. It was going to end in 2017. Yes, when I thought it was going to end in 2017. But everybody, a thousand people sent me email messages saying you're moving there because it's going to allow you to escape from abrupt irreversible climate change. And I'm like, no, the planet is heating. I'm moving towards the equator. That's stupid. That's the wrong way. So then, of course, we moved back to the United States, specifically to New York, a town called Pleasantville. I couldn't make this shit up. And <laughs> that's because Pauline's youngest sister was diagnosed with cancer, and she's the oldest of four children, and the only one capable of making an intelligent decision. So we moved back to try to take care of her youngest sister. And everybody said, oh, look, he's moving north because the whole thing's falling apart. <laughs> And then we had to get her father into hospice care because he clear, clearly had Alzheimer's, although nobody would admit it yet, so we had to get him diagnosed and blah, blah, blah. So we moved down to where her other two siblings live in Central Florida. And if you've ever been to Central Florida, you know how stupid that is. <laughs> the things I do for you. And so everybody said, oh, look, he's moving to Florida. That must be the place to be. That's how he's going to escape abrupt irreversible climate change. Really. People write this to me every day. And then I moved to Vermont. <sighs> People just really don't like me. That's my conclusion. I'm surprised you lasted this long, really. <laughs> so no, I haven't moved to any of those places because of abrupt irreversible climate change. I live where I do and how I do because I know about abrupt irreversible climate change and because I'm interested in being with people I love in a place that I love. Central Florida was an exception. <laughs> <laughs> the things we do for love. I want to stop right there and I'm sure you wanted me to stop quite a while ago. Comments or questions? We can take as much time as you want, Daniel. Hi. Um, just based on what you've covered, especially aerosol masking and the fact that we have hundreds of nuclear power plants that are going to go left unattended, it sounds like it doesn't really matter. If, if all of us, the whole, all eight billion of us left tomorrow, Earth is screwed. Oh, yeah. So I would venture to say there's nothing to worry about. Well, you know, Edward Abbey, one of the great lines, Southwestern writer, again, great influence on my life based on reading his books and essays. He said, if the, if the situation is hopeless, there's nothing to worry about. And I think the situation is hopeless. And so I don't think there's anything to worry about. I think that's just further initiative to live in the here and the now. You know, you, you all knew you were going to die, right? Probably when you were 12. I remember I was 11. I figured it out. My grandmother died. I barely, I barely knew my grandmother, right? We'd go see her once a year for a weekend. She lived a long ways away. 
And so I didn't know this person at all. She died and I cried for like five weeks. And a couple of years later, I'm looking back on that and I'm thinking, I, I didn't know Grandma McPherson. Why, why did I do that? And it's because that's when I realized I too was going to die. It wasn't about my grandmother. It was about me, because it's always about me. <laughs> Just like it's always about you in your life. What you do, if you aren't focused on you primarily, then you got something going on. Yes, it's about the people in your life. It's about your family and friends. It's about your collective community, but it better be about you too. Nobody's going to take care of you except you. I think that we have used all the resources of this earth, so we have nothing to complain about. You know, the children, the seventh generations that are coming after us, we only borrow the earth from them. Mm -hmm. Us, we have used everything. Uh, every, every single one of us sitting here, we have used the earth to its extreme. We have nothing to complain about. If we die tomorrow, we can say we have used it up, partied it up. Yeah. And I don't know if we can feel uh, good about our children. I pray that my children don't have to suffer too much during this end period. Sure. I pray that they come into this world, the time that they have, that they live fully with full of love, like you said. And I know that us, we have, we have celebrated, we have used the earth. We, we, we shouldn't have nothing to complain about because we are the ones that have really consumed this earth to its fullest, all of us, our age, our age group. We're the ones that have used this earth to, the, to its bones. Uh, I hope that our afterlife will, will teach us well how to, before we come back. If you believe in reincarnation or whatever, I hope we come back with a gentle heart, a mindful, uh, heartfelt, spirit when we come back as animals, as birds, as whatever. Uh, we're part of the reoccurring earth. We're not separate. We're part of the leaves that fall from the trees. We're part of the rain, the air that we breathe. A part of us never dies. I imagine it's 1979. I was 19 years old. Back in those days, college students were still allowed to read Limits to Growth, which came out in 1972. And so I realized in 1979 that I didn't want to have any children because this is going to be a mess. I was married to a Midwestern Catholic woman, the youngest of six children, for 32 years, 10 months, and 17 days. And we never had children. We never had children. That's the proudest thing I've done in my life. It's something I didn't do. Yes, people will suffer, many of them. What I'm trying to do with my work is prevent some people from suffering because they know. Because they know we're in the midst of abrupt, irreversible climate change. And that means we're going to lose habitat for human animals on this planet. And that's gonna cause a lot of suffering I don't want people to suffer. Thank you all very much. Thank you. I think we should wrap this. Thank you.